Today's story is a short story from Mark Twain called About Barbers. All things change except barbers. The ways of barbers and the surroundings of barbers. These never change. What one experiences in a barber's shop the first time he enters one is what he always experiences in a barber's shop. Afterward, till the end of his days. I got shaved this morning as usual. A man approached the door from Jones Street as I approached it from Maine. A thing that always happens. I hurried up, but it was of no use. He entered the door one little step ahead of me, and I followed in his heels and saw him take the only vacant chair. The one presided over by the best barber. It always has to be so. It always happens so. I sat down, hoping that I might fall heir to the chair belonging to the better of the remaining two barbers, for he had already begun combing a man's hair. While his comrade was not yet quite done rubbing up and oiling his customer's locks, I watched the probabilities with strong interest. When I saw that number two was gaining on, number one, my interest grew in solicitude. Then, number one stopped a moment to make a change on the bath ticket for a newcomer and lost ground in the race. My solicitude rose to anxiety. When number one caught up again and both he and his comrades were pulling the towels away and brushing the powder from their customer's cheeks, it was about an even thing which one could say, Next, first. My breath stood. My breath... <laughs> My very breath stood still with the suspense, but when at the culminating moment number one stopped to pass a comb a couple times through his customer's eyebrows, I saw that he had lost the race by a single instant, and I rose, indignant, and quitted the shop, to keep from falling into the hands of number two, for I have none of that enviable firmness that enables a man to look calmly into the eyes of a waiting barber and tell him he will wait for his fellow barber's chair. I stayed out 15 minutes and then went back, hoping for better luck. Of course, all the chairs were occupied now and four men sat waiting, silent, unsociable, distraught, and looking bored, as men always do who are waiting their turn in a barber shop. I sat down in one of the iron-armed compartments of an old sofa and put in the time for a while, reading the framed advertisements of all sorts of quack nostrums from dying for dying and coloring the hair. Then I read the greasy names of the private bayroom bottles, read the names and noted the numbers on the private shaving cups and the pigeonholes, studied the stained and damaged cheap prints of the walls of battles, early presidents, and voluptuous recumbent sultan sultanas and the tiresome and everlasting young girl putting her grandfather's spectacles on, execrated my, in my heart the cheerful canary and the distracting parrot that few barber shops are without. Finally, I searched out the la least dilapidated of last year's illustrated papers that littered the foul center table and conned their unjustifiable misre misrepresentations of old forgotten events. At last my turn came. A voice said, Next, and I surrendered to number two, of course. It always happens so. I said meekly that I was in a hurry, and it affected him as strongly as if he had heard, never heard it. He shoved up my head and put a napkin under it. He plowed his fingers into my collar and fixed the towel there. He explored my hair with his claws and suggested that I had needed, it needed trimming. I said I did not want it trimmed. He explored again and said it was pretty long for the present style. Better have a little taken off. It needed it behind, especially. I said I had it cut only a week before. He yearned over it reflectively a moment, and then asked, with a disparaging manner, who cut it? I came back at him promptly with the, you did. I had him there. Then he fell <laughs> to stirring up his lather and regarding himself in the glass stopping now and then to get close and examine his chin critically to inspect a pimple. Then he lathered one side of my face thoroughly and was about to lather the other when a dogfight attracted his attention and he ran to the window and stayed and saw it out, losing two shillings on the result in bets with the other barbers, a thing which gave me great satisfaction. He finished lathering and then began to rub in the suds with his hand. He now began to sharpen his razor on an old suspender, 
and was delayed a good deal on account of controversy about a cheap masquerade ball he had figured out figured at the night before in red cambric and bogus ermine as some kind of king. He was so gratified with being chaffed about some damsel whom he was smitten with his charms that he used every means to continue the controversy by pretending to be annoyed at the chafings of his fellows. Of his fellows. This matter begot more surveying of himself in the glass, and he put down his razor and brushed his hair with an elaborate care, plastering an inverted art of it down on his forehead, accomplishing an accurate part behind, and brushing the two wings forward over his ears with nice exactness. In the meantime, the lather dry was drying on my face, apparently eating into my vitals. Now he began to shave, digging his fingers into my countenance to stretch the skin, and bundling and trumbling my head this way and that, as convenience in shaving demanded. As long as he was on the tough sides of my face, I did not suffer, but when he began to rake and rip and tug at my chin, the tears came. He now made a handle of my nose to assist him shaving the corners of my upper lip, and it was by this bit of circumstantial evidence that I discovered that a part of his duties in the shop was to clean the kerosene lamps. I had often wondered in an indolent way whether the barbers did that or whether it was the boss. About this time, I was amusing myself trying to guess where he would be most likely to cut me this time. But he got ahead of me and sliced me on the end of the chin before I had gotten my mind made up. He immediately sharpened his razor. He might have done it before. I do not like a close shave. I would not let him go over me a second time. I tried to get him to put up his razor, dreading that he would make for the side of my chin, my pet tender spot, a place which a razor cannot touch twice without making trouble. But he said he was only but he said he only wanted to just smooth off one of the roughness. Well, smooth off a little roughness. And in the same moment he slipped his razor along the forbidden ground and the dreaded pimple signs of a close shave rose up smarting and answered to the call. Now he soaked his towel in bay rum and slapped it all over my face nastily. Slapped it over as if a human being ever yet washed his face in that way. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> then he dried it by slapping with a dry part of the towel, as if a human being ever dried his face in such a fashion, but a barber seldom rubs you like a Christian. Next, he poked bay rum into the cut place with his towel, then choked the wound with powdered starch, then soaked it with bay rum again, and would have gone on soaking and powdering it forevermore, no doubt, if I had not rebelled and begged off. <laughs> he powdered my whole face now, straightened me up, and began to plow my hair thoughtfully with his hands. Then he suggested a shampoo, and I said my hair needed it badly, very badly. I observed that I shampooed it my very se myself very thoroughly in the bath yesterday. I had him again. He next recommended some of Smith's hair glorifier and offered to sell me a bottle. I declined. He praised the new perfume, Joan's delight of the toilet, and proposed to me oh, and proposed to sell me some of that. I declined again. He tendered me a tooth wash atrocity of his own invention and when I declined, offered to trade knives with me. He returned to business after the miscarriage of this last enterprise, sprinkled me all over, legs and all, greased my hair in defiance of my protest against it, rubbed and scrubbed a good deal out, of my, out by the roots, and combed and brushed the rest, parting it behind, and plastering the eternal inverted arc of hair down on my forehead. And then while combing my scant eyebrows and defiling them with pomade, strung out an account of achievements of a six-ounce black and tan terrier of his till I heard the whistle blow for noon. And I knew I was five minutes too late for the train. Then he snatched away the towel, brushed it lightly about my face, passed his comb through my eyebrows once more, and gaily sang out, Next, this barber fell down and died of apoplexy two hours later. I'm waiting over a day for my revenge. I'm going to attend his funeral. <laughs>